Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, trading energies comfortably with quotation marks because uh, anyone that's been looking at their cope board knows there's absolutely no way to comfortably trade energies at all at this particular moment. Um, in the fall, it was natural gas that went berserk and, and we saw a huge volatility spike. Uh, this time around, it's crude oil and uh, gasoline and some of the distillate products. I personally don't think uh, retail traders should be dealing with anything other than crude oil and natural gas. And to be honest, uh, after what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure anyone wants to touch crude oil either. There are some micro size contracts. We'll talk about those, but it has been a completely treacherous market. Uh, we honestly, I've never seen really anything like it other than, you know, March, 2020 with the COVID shutdown. And then um, the following April, we had some some issues with crude oil going negative on the front month. But to be honest, even that I don't think was as volatile as what we're seeing now. I mean, we're seeing some ridiculous swings. And in our office, we tend to deal with uh, options. And I'm telling you, it's been a, it's been a big mess. And so if I seem a little bit frazzled, it's because, you know, I haven't slept in two weeks. So cut me some slack. Uh, anyway, this is my, my name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker. We run a boutique shop in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you have any questions or comments, uh, concerns, you can reach me at that information, my phone number, email address. If you're interested in learning more about our brokerage or just learning more about trading futures and options, you can visit decarlytrading.com and you can catch me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I post a lot of dog pictures. Some people think I'm crazy, but uh, if you're going to follow me on social media, just plan on meeting Frankie. This is my beagle. And like I said, we're from Las Vegas. I'm a broker, strategist, and author. I do contribute content to Jim Cramer's Mad Money, uh, Bloomberg Television, once or uh, probably about every other week on Bloomberg. And I do write a column for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. Our brokerage clients receive trading newsletters. Uh, some of them are focused on a particular commodity market. Others focus on the financial futures. And we even offer trading ideas and recommendations. Sometimes that's a blessing. Sometimes that's a curse. That's, part, that's how trading is. You know how that goes. I've written several books, but if you go to uh, Amazon or a bookstore, you'll see quite a few listed. Ignore everything else except for these three. These are the newest, the most updated. That's all you need to worry about. The others are out of print with old publishers, and honestly, they're ridiculously priced. So uh, we created our own imprint publishing service so that we could offer cheap and quality education without um, all the hubbub. So there you go. And you can find, if you go to tr tradingcommodityoptions.com, you'll find sample chapters and more information. So if you're interested, there you go. And first thing we're going to make sure everything, or everybody understands, we're trading, talking about trading commodities, and there's a substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not for everybody. And I'd say maybe not for most people. It's, it's, a, it's a stressful game. <clears throat> not everybody's... Not everyone's made for it. Let's put it that way. So why does everybody care about oil? Uh, crude oil plays a large role in our daily lives, whether we intentionally or not, we are speculating in it. It moves the stock market. It impacts gas prices, uh, plastic goods. In my opinion, it's the quintessential commodity contract. And we all have a general idea of what moves oil, right? Um, it's basic supply demand. There's an inventory report that comes out every Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. The Wednesday morning is the government version. You might notice that sometimes the report's bullish and the market sells off and vice versa. So don't let that surprise you. Um, the reality is it's really difficult to trade commodities based on fundamentals. I mean, it sounds like a, a simple process. It's based on supply and demand, right? If demand is greater than supply, prices go up. And if supply is greater, Prices go down, sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, in fact, fundamentals are usually the fundamental of the day is usually old news. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, a lot of it has to do with the, although the supply and demand figures are quantifiable, it's really difficult to get accurate data. And in real time, 
again, I mentioned we get a weekly report, but uh, believe it or not, just because the government issues a report doesn't necessarily mean it's absolutely accurate. And that's why there's two versions of the report. One is government, one is a private company that comes up with their own numbers. And guess what? They are not always the same. So there's a little bit of guessing involved. So if we're putting in supply demand equations and expecting to get some sort of magic consensus, it's, it's not going to work that way. Garbage in equals garbage out. In my opinion, if you're going to trade commodities, I believe you should combine fundamental analysis with chart work, seasonal patterns, CO2 T chart, which is the commitment of traders report issued by the CFTC. We don't really have time to talk about that today, but what that report is, is a weekly assessment of who's trading and how much they're trading. And when I say who, I'm just generally uh, categorizing large traders, large speculators, small speculators, and commercial hedgers. It can be kind of interesting and beneficial to know where those uh, traders are positioned in the market because it gives us an idea of whether or not a trend might be emerging or maybe if a trade is overcrowded. Also, if you're trading on fundamental information, it probably requires deep pockets and steadier nerves. And the reason being, these types of fundamental stories take a long time to play out. And whatever people happen to be talking about today doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to influence the market a month from now or even a week from now. Sometimes when the story seems as obvious and uh, unmanageable as it could possibly be is exactly when the tides turn. So in, when we saw crude oil peak around $140 in 2008-ish, I think it was mid-2008, at the time, if you would have turned on the TV, just about all the business news stations and all the business newspapers, all they were focused on was rising crude oil prices. And more interestingly, the fact that we were running out of oil. They were talking about peak oil. We, the world didn't have enough. We'd be running out of oil within the next handful of years. And next thing you know, financial crisis hits and uh, $140 oil becomes $40 oil, actually even a little bit lower. And then we made our way higher and in 2014, fracking was invented, invented and all heck broke loose and we dropped all the way back down to the $20, $30 area. So you can see that just because you think you have a good idea of fundamentals, you're reading the Wall Street Journal or whatever it is that you're looking at, doesn't necessarily mean that that information is gonna help you uh, in the markets. A friend of mine, I'm not gonna mention any names, but a friend of mine went on TV during the supply glut of 2000. 15, I think it was 2015, might have been the turn of 2016. Actually, I think it was early 2016. Anyway, uh, oops, there's a typo in that slide, sorry. But he basically went on TV and said, we will not see crude oil above $44 per barrel again in my lifetime. And he said that because supplies were so ample due to fracking. As we all know, um, we've spent the majority of time above $44 and that, per, that analyst is still alive. So fundamentals are hard. It's important to realize that commodities trade on seasonal patterns, or at least as a guideline they do, they don't always follow the seasonal pattern. In fact, uh, sometimes they do the exact opposite. The trick about seasonals is they're gonna work more than they don't, but when they don't work, it's like a blow it, blow it out of the water move. And we're witnessing that exactly right now in crude oil. Crude oil usually finds some sort of weakness in early March, late February, somewhere in that time frame. It generally sells off. In fact, over the last five years, we've seen some pretty big sell-offs in that time frame. Uh, this time around, it not only did it not sell off, but it we, we've seen one of the biggest and sharpest rallies in the history of crude oil, maybe even the biggest. Well, not quite the biggest, 2008 or 2007 was bigger, but you get the point. I mean, it's been, it's been chaos. The COT report that I mentioned earlier, um, we are going to just brush upon it. By the way, if you're interested in the COT report, there's a video on our website in our educational material that um, kind of in, illustrates what to look for, where to find it, that sort of thing. If you go to barchart.com, you'll find they have a free service 
with COT charts, it's actually pretty fabulous. But the idea is you wanna look and see uh, where speculators are positioned. In this case, the green line at the bottom is large speculators. And you can see every time that they get uh, accumulate a very large position, the rallies tend to fail. And that happened in 2014, it happened again in 2018, right before the, the plunge. And this time around, as we were going into this rally, to be 100% honest, I'm, um, I try to be an open book. I did not think that crude oil was gonna make it above the mid 90s. I really thought that we were gonna roll over. I'll show you a couple charts later to uh, show you why maybe I thought that. It wasn't just charting though, there was a lot of things that I was looking at, but the reality is, I should have just looked at the COT chart because this right here tells me that uh, speculators did not have an overly large net long position. So there was money on the sidelines um, available to buy. And by the, by the way, I didn't forget to look at the COT chart. I did see it, but the other information I was looking at was more compelling. And so I kind of bypassed it and I should not have. One thing to keep in mind about commodities is uh, people always talk about investing in commodities, but commodities don't go up over time like stocks do. In the stock market, I'm not talking about an individual stock, but like it, let's say an index, it's pretty forgiving. You can basically, uh, if you put money in and at the wrong time, let's say you bought the 2008 high and uh, you went went through the washout of March 2009, and you, you know eventually it all came back. So even though it wasn't a pleasant experience, you earned dividends, and you know that in the long run, maybe it'll take a year, maybe it'll take 10 years, stock market's probably going to go back up. In commodities, it doesn't really work that way. What if you would have bought crude oil in 100, at $140 a barrel? You would just now, maybe before today, uh, start getting excited about possibly getting your money back, and that doesn't even include the, what you probably lost in Contango as you rolled from contract to contract and transaction costs and all your time. So don't think that you can invest in a commodity and just ride it higher and uh, like you do stocks. It doesn't really work that way. It's more of a speculative trading market. So you're looking more, uh, when you look at commodities, you're looking more at like a swing trading type of environment, not an investing environment. That said, there's a lot more room to be wrong. You know, if you if you buy and the market goes down, uh, you know that you can't just hang on to it for five years and expect your money back. So it's a little tougher game in, in some respects, in many respects. So this is a slide I just threw in um, just to kind of give you an idea of what kind of craziness is going on in the oil market. This is actually a spread between the June futures and the December futures of 2022. That spread usually trades between a dollar and a half to five dollars at the max. I mean, realistically, you're probably looking at it should be like a three or four dollar spread. But with all of this nuts, nuts, nuts so trading going on and all these things, the spread actually jammed up to $18. And I think this is part of why we're seeing some of the chaos. I mean, there's lots of reasons. Don't get me wrong. I don't think this is the only reason, but there's a lot of people that trade futures spreads, and they trade so in pretty large size because their assumption is their risk is a little lower in a spread than it is if they're trading out rights. Most of the time that might be true, but there are times when the spreads blow out like this, when you find that it's actually more risky trading spreads than trading out rights in some cases, but that only happens occasionally and so people tend to forget about it or whatever. But when spreads like this blow out, it can really send ripple effects into the markets because it causes a lot of volatility and then people panic a little. And we're humans. Markets are basically the conglomerate of human reactions. And as humans, we panic and we tend to um, be emotional. That's just how it is. And if you want to think that that's taken away because of the algos, think again. The algos probably drive that even further because they they pick the trend or the direction and just push it. And so maybe they're even, maybe algos are even more emotional than humans. So if you're interested in trading oil, here's a few things you can do. Most people uh, use the ETFs because it's comfortable for them. They have a stock account already. There's, for example, in oil, there's an ETF, it's called USO. 
As a futures broker, I'm not a fan of this ETF for many, many reasons. I'll give you a couple reasons. But for one, it tends to, it, the not, not many people realize this, but it was USO that basically blew up the crude oil market in April of 2020. And it's because so many uh, retail investors had put money in USO and then they had to get out all at the right time, wrong, well, all at the same time, or they wanted to get out. And USO is, as an ETF, what they do is they take investors' money when people buy their ETF, and then they pool that into a commodity pool, and then they trade futures in that pool. Well, it, it, in April of 2020, they were holding a very, very large position in the front month futures. In fact, so large that it was hard for them to liquidate. And that's part of what caused the big fallout into negative pricing. So if you can imagine, as an investor, if you're buying ETFs similar to that, that are taking money and pooling it into futures, there's definitely some inefficiencies there. Uh, you're not trading crude oil futures. You're trading a product that is pooling money to trade crude oil futures for you. And it doesn't always go as planned. There are times where the underlying commodity will make a, let's say a 10% move and the ETF will make a 1% move or vice versa. So it's not that efficient. Also ETFs are only traded during normal market hours in futures, they trade around the clock. They trade 23 hours a day. Futures are more tax efficient. There's a 60, 40 blend between long-term and short-term tax uh, capital gains. And if you want leverage, leverage isn't always a good thing, but if you want leverage, you can get it in the futures markets without applying for a special brokerage account or without uh, paying interest and that sort of stuff. Also, there's no pattern day trading rules in futures. So the bottom line is, if you truly want to speculate on crude oil futures, then you're probably going to be best off doing it in the futures market because it's more efficient. And I'm going to, I know it sounds scary because most people, when they think about futures trading, they get, they think about the leverage and all the money you can lose. And that's exactly what you should think when you think about futures. However, the exchange has listed smaller contracts that make it uh, reasonable for small traders to, to get involved in these. So I'm going to show you some details on that. I already mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again. The average speculator is best off sticking to the liquid markets, which is crude oil and natural gas. In crude oil, there are mini contracts, micro contracts, and full size contracts. In natural gas, there are minis and full size. Both of them have options. The distillates, heating oil and gasoline, do not have mini or micro contracts, and the options are really, really thin, and they're untradeable, to be honest. A lot of people want to try to trade them, and it's a very expensive lesson to learn. There's a lot of open interest if you pull up an option chain, but that open interest is usually speculators or big funds. So if you as a retail trader want to trade one lot, two lot, 10 lots, whatever it is, you're going to have a really hard time getting in and out. And if you do get in, you may not be able to get out. And that's scary. So crude oil futures have a full-size contract that's 1,000 barrels, a mini contract that's 500 barrels, and a micro contract that's 100 barrels. With the micro contract, you're making or losing $1 per cent in crude oil. These margin requirements that I have listed on the slide are a little bit old. They just raised margins a couple of times in the last week, but um, let's just call it 10,000, 5,000, and 1,000 for crude oil. So with a micro contract, you're only trading 100 barrels, which in today's environment actually, as it turns out, is quite a lot. In a normal market, it's not so much. So Let's say crude oil is moving a dollar to two dollars a day on a micro contract you're making a hundred to two dollars a day today's session saw a 23 dollar range from high to low which means you would have made or lost twenty three hundred dollars on one micro so that's pretty insane um, not something you see very often and i hope not something we see really ever again to be honest but i'm sure it'll happen Markets are unpredictable. In natural gas, we have full-size contracts, mini contracts, and then options. And to give you an idea of what the difference is, this rally from the 
Thanksgiving or December, well, late, late, uh, sorry, late November, early December low through early February, I thought at the time was a really big rally, which is why I used it for this slide. So that particular rally represented $2,900 for a micro, $14,500 for a mini, and $29,000 for a full size. So this, the purpose of this slide is to just give you an idea of if you're trading a, let's say a $20,000 account, a micro futures contract might be very reasonable. It might be well within your budget. You can, uh, you know, and this is a pretty big move in oil, or it used to be. You can pick up two or three grand if you're right. And if you're wrong, you lose two or three grand. It's probably not going to ruin your life. Now, the craziest thing is we almost moved this amount just today in the front month. So, I mean, there's no words for, for that. The natural gas also has a mini contract, which is still can be pretty dangerous or lucrative if you're on the right side. It This move, um, basically uh, from 360 to $5, so we're talking about a dollar and a half roughly, would be fifth, about $14,000, $15,000 on a full-size contract and about $3,500 on a mini. So a lot of people, when they come to trade with us, they think that minis and micros are a waste of their time, that there's just not enough uh, not leverage because the minis and micros have the same amount of leverage as full size, but they just don't think they're getting enough bang for their buck. The reality is when markets are moving the way that we've seen in natural gas in late 2021, and then thus far in crude oil in 2022, minis and micros are plenty for most traders. In fact, even a sing single mini or micro might be too much for some people with, with this type of environment. So be really careful, don't get complacent. The great thing about the micros is you can scale trade. Scale trading is a strategy in the futures markets that used to really only be reserved for people that have very deep pockets. So it takes a big account to, um, by the way, if you're not sure what scale trading is, it's bas basically dollar cost averaging. So let's say that your desire is to be long five crude oil micros. You could simply, you'd start with one. Let's say you think crude oil is a good buy, but you wanna take it easy. So you start with one. And then if the market goes against you, you start, you add another one. If the market goes against you again, you add another one. I'll give you an example of what this might look like. With the full size contract, that's a really, really, really dangerous strategy. Even though the, the goal is to, improve your average entry price. If you don't have a huge account, you're not going to be able to write it out and uh, your, your strategy is not going to have enough time or money to play out. With a micro, it will or it should. So I'll point this out again, even though I've already mentioned it, but uh, again, I'm a commodity broker, so I'm biased. Also keep that in mind. But the micro futures is far more efficient than trying to trade a, a crude oil ETF. It comes with tax benefits. It's 23 hours a day. And it's also, even though it's micro-sized, it has the exact same leverage, leverage, sorry, the same leverage, but less risk than the full-size contract. So you can save a, a lot of, or solve a lot of problems with micro futures as opposed to trading the outright full-size contract, which let's face it, on today's session, from if there was a $23 range from high to low, on the full size contract, that's $23,000 for one contract. So uh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> but you can, you know, even a micro would be $2,300, but that's at least, you know, that's not um, for most retail accounts, at least you can reasonably manage it. So here are the problems that micro oil futures solve. There's less margin required. You can hold overnight without losing sleep. You're not forced out before the close. A lot of people are trying to trade the full size future, crude oil future in a small account. And because of that, they don't have the margin available to hold their position overnight because most brokerages offer day trading margins during the day. So it's a discounted lower margin rate during the day. But if you wanna hold into the close, that's when you have to meet the exchange margin requirement. And a lot of people are trading beyond their means, so they, don't, they can't hold into the close. They have to get out before 
the market closes. And this is where uh, people really get into trouble because if your trading signal gives you a buy two hours before the close and you take it, but the market hasn't moved or it's gone against you, but it hasn't reached your, your loss limit or whatever your situation you're in, you're not giving your system enough time to work. So even if your strategy is, is good, it's, you're not getting the full benefit of it because you're unable to hold into the close. But if you trade micros, you can do that with a relatively small account. A four or $5,000 account would allow you to do that pretty easily. So because of the smaller size, you have, you have less or more lasting power. You're less prone to panic. Maybe you don't need a stop loss because there's, you're dealing with smaller size and you might even consider scale trading. You're more likely to stay in trades that don't go in your favor immediately. So uh, because there's more room for error, there's less account volatility. It also helps you to mitigate emotional turmoil. It's a lot less stressful making or losing $10 a tick as opposed to, or I'm sorry, $1 a tick as opposed to $10 a tick. And if you're just testing out your strategy and you want to trade the full size contract, that's fine, but maybe paper trade or at least uh, paper trade with some skin in the game using the micro contract. And finally, with the micro contracts, it gives people the ability to trade on a longer time frame. So instead of swing trading for days or weeks, maybe you hold on for months. Before the micro contracts, it would have taken a large account to be able to do that. But with the micros, it's much easier to do that sort of strategy. You can also be a little more aggressive in your entry. So if you're the type that is a swing trader looking to buy the dips and sell the rips, it's a little scary to do with the full size contract because if you've ever looked at an intraday crude oil chart, you know that it can move and it moves pretty wildly and violently, especially now. So it's hard to, to buy into support or sell into resistance with a full size contract, but maybe with a micro, you'd be comfortable doing just that. This is an example of what a bullish scale trader might, or scale trade might look like. Let's say in late December, you notice that the crude oil rally is coming up against uh, moving average support and you think it's, it's a good buy, at least for the long run. Let's say you buy a micro at 73 and not long after Thanksgiving strikes and illiquidity drives the market down to 66. You decide to buy another because that is a trend line support area. You think it's going to hold. So now you're long too. That support gives way and it comes all the way back down to the $60 area, which is where we had bottomed out previously. And at that point, you might actually be comfortable enough to buy another one because you're trading micros and they're small contracts. The result would be an average entry of $67 with a maximum draw down of $1,500. I think we can all agree that's pretty reasonable for building a nice position in, in crude oil. If you were trading a full size contract, your max drawdown would have been 15,000 and you'd have a lot of risk on the table with three futures. I'm gonna show you another strategy that um, should only be done if you truly, truly understand the risks and you're willing to accept them. And if you understand how options work in crude oil, and again, you're willing to accept the risk. Uh, I'll be frank, we had similar positions on going into the last couple of weeks in oil and it did not turn out well, simply because not necessarily because the price exceeded our strike prices, but because the volatility exploded to such levels that uh, it was really, it's really tough to manage options. Um, I mean, without getting into too much detail, but we had some risk reversals and we also had some call ladders. So we actually had bullish option spreads in the front months and bearish option spreads in the back months. And without knowing that the volatility was going to explode to basically historical levels, we thought that our risks were relatively managed and we thought we were trading relatively small size. But when volatility explodes, sometimes it happens immediately and the options blow up for very quickly. So for example, there were some options in oil that went from 
like a thousand dollars in value to twenty five to thirty thousand dollars in value in a very short amount of time. So this type of strategy normally is going to be relatively manageable, but occasionally, you know, uh, World War III or you know something that it's a little out of the ordinary that triggers a lot of panic. Occasionally, things can get away from you. So do not try to do this if you don't fully understand what's going on. So anyway, this, these were prices that were taken this morning before the drop. You might get another chance to do something like this, or you could do it in the reverse. If you, if you think oil is probably going to go back up, which to be honest, I think it probably is going to go back up. I don't think that uh, tops are usually not made in a day like that. I think it was profit taking and all kinds of you know, stop running and things like that as far as the sell off, but time will tell. So you could do this exact same strategy to the upside now that we've flipped the other way by selling a put and buying a call. But I'm gonna show you what a risk reversal would be if you were bearish. So this, and again, this is not a recommendation. This is just a hypothetical idea to, to give you an idea of um, how to approach a market while giving yourself plenty of room for error. So as of yesterday's settlement prices, you could have sold in August, 140 call option for $5, that's $5,000. And you could have used some of the proceeds to purchase an August 85 put for $3. The net credit is 2000. So if you hold all the way to expiration and oil is below 130, but above 85, you keep the $2,000 minus your transaction costs. So you get paid even though what you thought was gonna happen didn't happen. The margin is about $4,600. The risk is unlimited above 140. If the market goes above 140, it's like being short a futures contract basically. And your profit potential is theoretically unlimited below 85. A lot of people always mention, well, it's not unlimited because it can't go below zero. But first of all, the profit potential, if it did go to zero would be $85,000 and crew did go below zero. So I'm, I'm just gonna keep saying unlimited because that's theoretically what the compliance officers like. That said, you're probably not gonna make 85,000. If you're right and the option and the, the market goes down, you know, hopefully you'll be happy with uh, you know, that option doubling or tripling in value. So let's look at a chart to get, give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. This actually was taken right before I got on. So this, this is a daily chart of August crude oil. It does show today's down, uh, down move, which coincidentally seems to have held moving averages. Um, so maybe that was it for the correction. And maybe we do go back up. I wouldn't be shocked to see that. But to be honest, this is, this is a wild one. So not for the faint of heart. And if you're not in the market, I'd probably suggest just staying out. To be honest, there's uh, more money... People get excited when they see this kind of volatility, but the reality is most people lose money in this type of situation as opposed to make it. It seems easy because the moves are big, but uh, when you got money on the line and things are swinging two, three, four dollars in a couple of seconds, it's tough. Also, just as a side note, when the market gapped higher on Sunday night and rallied uh, 13, 14, 15 dollars on the front month, like right on the open within five minutes of the open, the liquidity was awful. I've never, I've been doing this for a long, long time and I've never seen liquidity like that. The bid ask spread on some of the futures contracts was like a dollar to $2. So if you, specifically July was like that. So if you bought July crude oil and then immediately sold it, you would have lost 1500 to $2,000. That's how illiquid it was. Normally the bid ask spreads a couple pennies, maybe even a penny on the front month. And if you even if you look at it today, which the liquidity didn't get that bad, but it was still pretty bad. Today, the bid ask spread on some of these crude oil futures were four, five, ten cents. That's highly unusual. It's usually really, really tight, but it just goes to show you when markets are this volatile, what generally happens is, and I hate to say this, but this is probably what is in the process of happening now, is all the speculators are getting blown out. So on Sunday night, when we gapped higher and rallied through thin markets and ran everybody's stops, that wiped out all of the bears. And then today's big correction wiped out all of the bulls. Who's going to be left are people that um, 
had enough money to survive or had enough uh, experience to survive or, you know, for whatever reason, they made it. The majority of speculators are probably on the sidelines and they're probably happy to be there at this point. The good news is once you get those big washouts, and we've seen it before, we saw it in March 2020 in oil, April 2020, I'm gonna, that's basically one event, not two. But once all that washed out, crude oil stabilized, and we actually have rallied ever since. I'll show you a chart in a few minutes of what happened afterwards. But sometimes once you wipe out all that speculative money is, um, sadly, that's kind of what's needed to just kind of calm things down and to get back to fundamentals. So anyway, back to this trade. This is how much room for error you would have if you executed something like this. If you sold the 140 call for $5, assuming you held expiration, as long as oil doesn't rally another $30 from here, you at least make something. If it's at 142 at expiration, you gave back the premium you collected for the trade, so you break even. So your break even point is actually 142. Now, I don't want to mislead anybody. I want to be uh, perfectly honest. On a trade like this, like I mentioned before, we had similar trades on that just got completely blown out. Um, I mean, we're honestly, we're still holding some of them. But the problem is if the volatility changes. So volatility right now is historically high. It's probably going to go down. So the risk of that sort of thing happening is probably not that great now as opposed to a couple of weeks ago. But there's no guarantee it goes down. So let's say that you sell the 140 call and volatility goes up. And let's say that the crude oil market doesn't ever make it to 140. Let's say it gets to 125, 130. Well, if the volatility is still increasing as it's approaching your strike price, even if it's 10, $15 away, that option you sold for $5 could become very, very expensive. It could become $8, $10, $15. There's no limit. We've, like I said, we saw options worth $1,000 going for 25, 30 grand. So it can get really, really crazy. Anyway, but in a more normal market, this is actually a pretty great idea. And I'm trying to, I don't wanna talk anybody out of uh, trading commodities obviously, or scare anybody, but I just wanna make sure that everyone understands that if you do these sorts of trades, even if you're trading micros in this type of environment, don't be complacent. Always pay attention to your risk. It only takes a few minutes. Today, uh, when oil broke support, it literally dropped $12 in like two minutes. So be careful out there. So I am a fan of option trading, even though, to be honest, the last... Uh, a couple of weeks have not been very nice to option traders. Uh, not only with crude oil, but we had a situation in wheat <laughs> that got a little crazy. And in wheat, we didn't really do anything wrong. We had some, we had recommended some call ladders to our clients, and then we had recommended that they buy futures against it once things got started getting up towards our risk zones. So we did all the right things, hedged all the right ways, uh, but still had quite a bit of stress because as as you may know, wheat went limit up for six days in a row. And what happens is when the futures go locked limit, they stop trading. So the limit was at 75 cents. So every day we could go up 75 cents and stop. And unless enough people were willing to sell it at that price, it would just keep going up again the next day until they found, find some sellers. So we were long futures, which is great, but we were also short calls, call options against those. One for one, so thank goodness. But the problem is, even though if you're long a future and short a call, it's basically a covered call. In theory, your risk should you should have no upside risk. As the futures market's going up, your call options losing, and you're making on the futures, it balances out, but you still get to keep the premium you collected when you got in. So everything's fine. The problem is when the market's locked limit for six days. The futures can only go up 75 cents a day, but the options were free to go up in value whatever people were willing to pay. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of desperate people out there wanting to cover their risk. So if they were short futures and they couldn't get out of the futures markets, they were going to the option market and buying calls so that they at least knew what the worst case scenario was. So calls that were um, theoretically valued at, let's say 5,000 
we're going for 15, 20, 30,000 a piece. So that's kind of kind of couple of weeks we've had. So we're long the futures, short the calls, but we couldn't benefit from the appreciation in the futures simply because the exchange had the price limits. So I've never experienced that ever uh, until now. So that was interesting. And I'm not going to say that I don't like option trading anymore because I had a bad experience in wheat. So I'm not going to do that. The reality is no matter what your strategy is or no matter what your trading approach is, there's always going to be times where the environment is just not conducive for that type of trading. So um, yeah, so it is what it is. I mean, if you're trading futures outright with stops, someday you're going to have days where it literally just stops you out every five minutes. And then, so there's that. But in general, in a more normal market, I believe option trading is a good way to go about it because it usually reduces stress, usually reduces account volatility, gives you more room for error. Um, it mitigates the emotional turmoil, usually. And there's two ways to make money when you're using options and option spreads. You can make it through the time value erosion. If you think back to that example that I just showed you, Crude oil could trade sideways and that option would, or that strategy would still make money because the time value erosion would benefit you because you collected more premium than you paid. Or you could also make money on the direction of the market. If crude oil drops, it's possible you make money on your long put. So there's two ways to make money as opposed to only making money if you're right on the direction. Now, uh, option trading is a probability game, and in normal market conditions, buying options outright is a really uh, a low probability venture. Options are priced to lose, and even if you're the type that buys vertical spreads, it is not necessarily a high probability venture. It makes you feel better because you're paying a little less to get in. But the reality is options are eroding assets and they're priced to lose. So more often than not, you're going to lose money. But the nice thing about buying options is you have limited risk and there's really no stress other than the frustration of watching your options lose value. In general, you want to try to be cheap. You don't want to spend a lot of money on an option that you know is probably going to expire worthless or probably erode in, you know, with time value erosion. So in my opinion, and again, it's not perfect and it comes with some wrinkles occasionally, but if you can use the money, the market's money to finance your positions, much like we, what, what I showed you with the risk reversal, you're selling a call and then you're using the market's money to buy your put. Usually that's actually a pretty good way to go. I should also point out, you don't really want, you don't ever want to use a risk reversal in, in uh, in the direction of the trend. And what I mean by that is if crude oil, like for example, uh, let's go back to this last chart here. If you thought crude oil was going up, not down for this risk reversal, it would not be a good idea probably to sell the put and buy the call. Now it might be, um, actually it might've been on this day, but let's, let's rewind to here. With the market oversold, put options are expensive and calls are cheap. So it's a good idea to sell a put and buy a call there. Here, let's assume today didn't happen. Here, it's probably not a good idea to sell a put and buy a call because you're, you have unlimited risk on the put and then the, and your put is, you're, being, you're basically selling it on the, from the discount rack, it's cheap. If a market's overbought, the calls are usually expensive and the puts are cheap. So you want to try to do a risk reversal when the option you're buying is cheap and the option you're selling is expensive. Now, again, the trick is to for that option to not get more expensive after you sell it. So they don't call it crude oil for nothing. It's, it's definitely crude. Uh, crude oil futures are efficiently priced and they're convenient to trade around the clock usually with liquidity, but they are very volatile. Trading beneath your means is the one way to reduce your feeling of panic. And this can be done with micro futures, option spreads, or both. 
thinking outside of the box enables traders to manage risk while sticking to their original speculation. And what I mean by that is in that with that risk reversal that I showed on the previous slide, if the market did rally against the position, at some point you could buy futures against it. You could decide maybe even start with micros or minis to get delta neutral and uh, use that to hedge your risk. Now I will warn you in very volatile conditions, there's nothing that says once you buy that protection, the market's not gonna turn around and drop like a rock. And then it's gonna be frustrating because you actually lost money on your hedge as opposed to the speculation itself. So I guess the purpose of today's class is the, the, none of this is easy. If it were easy, everybody would do it. So always mind your risk. If you're interested in learning more about trading commodity options, visit tradingcommodityoptions.com. And here's my contact information one more time. If you have any questions or any interest in, in trading futures or options, you probably, after everything I said, you probably don't ever want to trade commodities. But trust me, it's not always like this. I mean, we're talking about uh, probably once in a lifetime kind of stuff going on, especially in wheat. So those types of things happen in all markets. By the way, as, as crappy as I've felt about wheat and crude oil this week, at least I wasn't short nickel and didn't shut the exchange down. So it could be worse. Um, okay, I have a couple of minutes. Are there any questions or anything? I'm actually going to uh, pull up a crude oil chart just for a minute so I can sh show you what went on today. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so this is a daily chart of crude oil. And you can see that like in normal times, you have these really small price bars, it goes up or down 50 cents a day, a dollar, uh, $2 pretty big day. This day right here was right before Thanksgiving or maybe the day after Thanksgiving and crude was down $10. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a really big day. And now, perspectives have changed because $10 actually isn't that big of a deal in this type of a market. Today we closed down $15 and that was way off the lows. So that's just pretty, uh, pretty spectacular move here. And there were a lot of people, I know it's kind of hard to believe because the news cycle was Putin's going to war and this and that. There were a lot of people, including myself, that thought that a lot of that was already priced into oil. Um, Russia is a, a big producer, but they're not that big of a producer. And Iran is bringing some barrels online. And I keep waiting for US shale producers to come on, but they uh, have been pretty disappointing. But with all of that said, if you look at a chart, if you take out the war, we probably had a really good shot at holding the mid 90s. Uh, maybe the worst case scenario would have been 104, 105. And that's just based on chart work and fundamentals prior to the war and that sort of thing. Um, but a lot, the world changed basically overnight. And so, and the market reflected that. So crude oil shot up uh, beyond any fathomable levels. You know, when markets get like this, they're really emotional. People are buying and selling because they're, they're scared. They have to, they're out of money. They're on a margin call, whatever the case is. And so there's not any, um, it's more of a reaction and it's more of, um, it has nothing, let's put it this way, it has nothing to do with fundamentals or charts. None of that matters. It's just how people are positioned and do they need to be in, do they need to be out? It's really that simple. And unfortunately, during that kind of chaos, the price discovery is really, really ugly. And if you happen to be caught in the middle of it, it's a tough ride. And I know some people have said, well, if you're caught in crude oil, why don't you just get out? Well, if it was a futures contract, it might be that simple. If you're trading options, it's really not really not quite that simple because you're trading option spreads. Once the vol explodes, um, it does. And there's, I mean, you could get out, but you're the, I just told you that options are priced to lose and there's time value involved. So if you buy options back that have exploded just completely 
exploded in value, you're taking really, really big losses when most of the time you could probably adjust and ride things out. But again, it's, it's a, it's a tough game. So anyway, interesting times. We'll be talking about this, I'm sure for a very long time and we've learned some very valuable lessons. So there's that. I'm not, somebody's asking about the uh, oil ETFs. I'm not familiar with Gush, to be honest. In, in any case, almost the only ETFs that I know of that actually hold the underlying commodity is GLD and uh, silver. I think it's SLV. They're actually holding the commodity, not futures, but almost all ETFs take investor money and then put it into the futures market. So it's, re it's really, really un inefficient. If you want to trade futures, I highly recommend just go ahead and trading futures, but do it with micros or minis, you know, keep it small because this is, it's very unforgiving if you're on the wrong side. Uh, somebody's asking about copper. This is a copper chart. Let me look at pull up the weekly chart, sorry. Um, so it's a little too early to tell if this was a false breakout or just the beginning. I think there's just so many, um, so many traders that are in risk, risk off mode, meaning they're, they're liquidating trades that we're getting a lot of this uh, severe chop. And so I think, you know, I, I think it's too early to say as long as copper holds above, let's say 440, I think we probably go back up and, and make new highs. This is what a monthly chart looks like. But you want to be really careful. Um, copper is not the type of market that tends to stay up forever, which in fact, I mentioned this, most commodities are not. Most commodities generally uh, rally and then fail. If copper is going to rally, which I think it probably will, because I happen to be bullish, or I'm sorry, bearish the US dollar, and I think that'll help commodities out a little bit, the short run. Uh, if copper does go up, it's probably looking for about 550, but I wouldn't expect anything more than that. 550 would probably be a place to be highly bearish. Okay, I think I've used up most of my time. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to send me an email or, um, okay, we have one more. Someone wants to look at wheat. Okay, well, this is wheat. Um, you can see that what we've seen the last few days is extremely uh, unusual. <laughs> we expected wheat to hold resistance. We've been bullish wheat. That's the ironic thing. We were bullish wheat um, mostly all year, especially from $758. But we were looking for like $950, $10. Um, we weren't thinking $13. And I, honestly, I don't think wheat would have ever, ever printed in the $13. If it weren't for the price limits, what happens is people get really scared. If it's bad enough to be in a trade that's going the wrong way. But if you're in the trade that's going the wrong way and you can't get out, the nerves amplify. And so I think what we saw was just a lot of um, frenzy and panicked liquidation all the way up. And now that that's done, I think we probably come back to some sort of, I'd say my analysis is this is kind of a fair value. Somewhere between 10 and $11 is probably where wheat should be, at least for now, until we can figure out what's going on with Ukraine. It sounds like the wheat's not gone. It was already planted. It's just not um, able to get through the ports. So that's my understanding. Things can change. But we also are dealing with dry weather in the US. And so that's, that's supportive. Um, that said, $13 wheat was just, just didn't need to happen. We have seen $13 wheat once before in 2008. And honestly, that was kind of a fluke as well. 
this price price spike over ten dollars up to 13 happened very quickly and as you can see it didn't last very long that price spike was there was a lot of things going on but it was right when the markets became electronic before that it was open outcry so that was like the first of the electronic markets started trading overnight the liquidity was very 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 light and there was one big trader maybe it was a hedge fund or maybe it was his family money i can't recall but one big trader that went rogue and sold a bunch of futures and then was squeezed out of them and almost put a big brokerage out of business to be honest so this all all of this price action here was just kind of a blip of um a big trader blowing up <laughs> So sometimes it's as simple as that. Okay, we'll do one more. Uh, this is what we've got for soybeans. Um, I've got some old notes on here. Don't, don't read my notes, they're probably... So we've been bullish soybeans as well, and we're looking for uh, a move up here to about 18 to 1830. The last rally stopped short at 1760. I'm on the fence. Maybe that was enough to do it. Uh, maybe not. In theory, we should run back up and, and test 1830, but it's a little bit iffy. So, so be careful if you have uh, risk on in either direction. It could go, honestly, could go either way. If it goes up, we're probably looking at 1830. If it goes down, we're probably looking at 1550. So, and maybe that, maybe it, that is how it's going to play out. Maybe it comes back down to 1550 and then goes back up and retest that long term trend line. Cause it's actually pretty early in the season for grains to be on this big of a tear. It's just kind of a really odd year. Okay. All right. That'll do it. I appreciate everyone. Appreciate everybody coming out. Um, this platform is QST, by the way, quick screen trading.